Táto diskusia má byť venovaná problematike segregácie, desegregácie v vzdelávaní a máme tu predvícenú výstredku, ktorá môže poskytiť bezpostrednú skúsenosť z problematike segregácie, desegregácie a spolupných členov politických. Profesora Angelika Pachlieda, ktorý Okrem toho, že je akademikom a venuje sa otázka o segregácii a rovnú budúcnosti a rovnú budúcnosti a rovnú budúcnosti, tak taktiež sa samozrejme na akademickú z tej iniciatóre na dlhoročné pôsoby v CLS Crimes Project, čiže na projekte všetkých práv a taktiež má skúsenosť z prvého politiky. The focus is on the Roma issue in Slovakia. Last but not least, Mr. Vladimir Burian, who is editor-in-chief of the Dobra Škola Magazine. With, uh, it's a monthly. And he's also a director of exam testing corporation in Slovakia. Those are our guests. Do for you in the audience to ask your questions and uh, to uh, focusing on issues of segregation and desegregation at uh, in our schools and i'd like to start with uh, what may be a key thing for this debate if we talk about segregation what we are actually talking about what this concept means and i'd like to first ask Professor Orfield, what in your practice in American society means segregation in educational system? Segregation oh. uh, Segregation has different meanings, but it in our in our situation basically um, in our analysis, we're looking basically at levels of racial separation in the schools. It's, it's, we use it mostly as a statistical concept and relate it to um, other uh, opportunities and outcomes of education. There's also a legal concept, which is um, illegal segregation, which means that it was intentionally caused um, historically or in the present moment by actions that were discriminatory. Um, of course, in 17 of our states, up until the time the Supreme Court acted, it was caused by state law and state constitution. So it was unambiguously caused by intent. In almost all of our other cities that have ever been examined by our courts, it's been found that there have been a series of practices by official agencies that either caused or intensified racial separation in the schools. So in the legal concept, almost every place that's been looked at for one reason or another in the United States has been found to be guilty of discrimination historically. And in the legal concept, that creates an obligation since it violates our constitution to do something to, to correct it. So what I'll basically be talking about when I talk about research is the statistical concept, which, which measure different ways. One of the ways is to measure the randomness of distribution of students among schools, um, which goes from basically complete apartheid, where all the schools are completely dominated by one racial or ethnic group, to um, complete racial balance, which is where 
the different groups are distributed randomly among the individual schools. Um, so we'll, we can talk about different statistical concepts as we go along, but um, primarily in the social sciences we talk about the statistical concept of separation, and from, primarily in, in the law we talk about the cause um, and whether or not the segregation is illegal. Thank you very much. Maybe uh, an add-on question because one of your uh, researches focused on the changes in understanding of segregation throughout the timeline. Has there been any shift from the 60s of the last century? How is segregation perceived in comparison with the, with the um, current days? Uh, many uh, work with the uh, uh, notion symbolic segregation uh, that may be more inclusive, or I mean, uh, which may m include more of, uh, things. And uh, you are refraining from the notion of physical segregation. Um, the question is, has the concept basically changed? Um, and it certainly changed in the minds of some researchers or some intellectuals. Um, it hasn't changed. Um, it hasn't changed in terms of how we define it legally or how we define it statistically. And what we found, what we find mostly in the research that we do on segregation, is that whatever its cause is, the segregation is usually on multiple dimensions of race plus class plus sometimes language and that it is very powerfully linked both to educational opportunities and educational outcomes in quite a systemic way, very, and very high statistical relationships. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask the Slovak speakers as well. How do you perceive, uh, how do you perceive in Slovakia segregation? Uh, we have heard that there can be a legal definition of segregation, there is a sociological, statistical definition of segregation or certain level. Uh, at which we can start talking about segregation or non-segregation. So I'd like to ask the Slovaks, uh, how is uh, the Slovak legislation like and what's the practice, uh, what's the experience? Can we say that we have segregated schools? From the human rights viewpoint, uh, I can agree with many of what was said, and I would like to underline two aspects. First of all, it is not uh, voluntarily that we segregate children, because in Slovakia there is a great dilemma about uh, national educational system, because it may seem to be a segregated system, which is first of all happening based on some voluntary decision of the parents of children and it is also um, an indicator of uh, the rights of some minorities uh, or groups and in the legal theory this is not a segregation because uh, it uh, happens based on a consensus and based on voluntary decision and even after the changes that uh, occurred in the United States uh, there were still universities for so-called blacks and uh, this was kind of uh, strengthening and um, internal decision of this group and uh, this involuntariness cannot be really measured and, and I'm just trying to say that uh, there is a concept here of informed consent, which is important. So on the legal level, uh, we have to say that parents must agree, first of all, with where their children are placed. So this consent is important, and this principle of voluntariness has to be maintained. So this is one aspect that I wanted to stress. And on the other hand, there is symbolic level, which means we often talk about some physical separation and it can have various uh, forms uh, 
uh, special schools. Uh, it happens also in regular schools within one classroom. You can even see segregation. And what I've experienced myself is that uh, we've had Roma schoolmate Irenka, and she always sat in the last row. And uh, we cannot say that we've had any segregated education. Uh, we just uh, know very well that usually Roma children would sit somewhere at the back. So these, this is also one of the forms of um, segregation, one of the symbolic forms. Um, it can also take form of different approach of teachers uh, to different groups of um, uh, school attendants based on their ethnic origin. Uh, some teachers tend to have some racist comments, um, etc. So these are all various forms of discrimination that take place. Uh, segregation is not defined in the legal uh, law and order of Slovakia. And uh, in the school law, uh, the segregation is prohibited, but there is uh, not much of a definition included there. And uh, this notion is not included in any type of reporting or measuring or evaluation. So segregation in Slovakia is a virtual term still, but uh, because we know that segregation is one of the forms of uh, discrimination uh, which is strongly enshrined in our legislation, and uh, segregation is in direct form of, indis of discrimination. And uh, therefore, uh, we have to say that segregation has long been prohibited, but there is no definition framework which would clearly define this notion. And there's one more thing I'd like to say. Uh, segregation violates human rights. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if I look at it from the viewpoint of impacts or effects, then segregation is a tool which uh, does have real impact on children. It can cause uh, often uh, the lower quality of their education and qualification. And uh, as a consequence, uh, their prospects uh, for getting jobs in the future are lower. Uh, we've had a meeting uh, uh, in the morning together with Mr. Orfield, and it was said there that segregation is not illegal uh, if equality is still maintained. So if there is equal treatment maintained and there is equality of results, then segregation is not regarded as illegal. And uh, to me, um, I really agree with this. Uh, it's not only about physical separation, it's about the impact on children's results and education. So if it leads uh, to lower chances uh, and, and potential uh, job finding in the future, then it is uh, negative. My question now is, uh, does Slovak, educa Slovak education system provide uh, equal chances? So the question really is um, about the equal chances of our children, regardless of segregation. Mm. Uh, problem is the segregation of Roma children and this notion or discrimination against Roma children. And the second problem is about uh, the status of Slavic educational system as such. And here we are not talking about Roma children only, about those children with, who are segregated in some classrooms and who we are now trying uh, to put back into majority classes. Here we are also talking about children who have some other specific needs. And um, I dare to say that in our educational system, we're not ready in regular schools to adopt these children in regular classrooms. Uh, and this applies to children with various disabilities, uh, as well as children with uh, social disadvantages. So we're not only talking about Roma children, we're talking about kids with uh, different uh, education needs, uh, specialties, whether they've had some diagnosis of um, dysgraphia, etc. So all these children need and require a special approach and uh, they require a tailored approach in order to develop their special potential. So our regular schools are not ready to cater for the needs of these uh, various groups of children and we could go on uh, with more details if someone's interested. <coughs> 
I would like to add to this introductory round. I'm trying to put this um, topic into a broader concept, uh, which is dealt with by most of the countries. In most civilized countries, uh, there is some compulsory age until which children have to attend school, and each country is dealing with a major problem of whether all children should be educated in one type of school with a uniform curricula, or whether it would be better for children to be divided throughout the educational system based on their prerequisites, uh, talents, etc. And this question has never been unanimously answered. It's a matter of preferences. For instance, Finland believes that it's good to keep all the children for as long as possible in one uniform type of school and not to create different types of schools for various groups of children. Then there are other countries like Germany, for instance, or Austria, even Slovakia, which believe that at some point throughout the cycle of education, uh, children should be divided. So that's why we, for instance, have uh, eight-year high schools, etc. So there is no uh, consensus on this issue. The trouble is that there are different stakeholders who are looking at this problem from different viewpoints. We can look at it from methodological or didactic viewpoint, and we can try and see whether for Roma or persons with disabilities or Hungarian nationality would be better to be together in like regular schools with healthy children, Slovak children, etc., or whether it would be better for them to attend some special type of school where their specifics could be taken into consideration to a better respect. Then children could feel that uh, they are cornered somewhere and se separated from others. Then there is a viewpoint of politics of human rights activists uh, who may remember that in the past something like this happened due to racial reasons such as apartheid in Africa, etc. So uh, these people may be reminded about these bad historical points uh, and they don't want this group to be excluded or segregated. So if we take into consideration all these different viewpoints, we will not ever get anywhere. We should reach consensus from the pedagogical and methodological viewpoint. And I don't think we will answer this question in the same way for Roma, for persons with disabilities, etc. It may well happen that for one group of these children, it would be better to have the special schools, whether for the other group, it would be good to, to be included into majority schools. The word segregation itself um, is something I don't like because it makes discussion harder. We've had differentiation in the field of pedagogy, whether to teach together or in a different way. So we can have pros and cons for each of these. But once I call one of these options segregation, uh, I give a negative connotation to this topic. And I make this discussion harder to carry on because if someone says you are for the segregation, it means to be negative. So, uh, me personally, I prefer to talk about some sort of differentiation uh, or use of any kind of more neutral word which wouldn't be so aggressive. Because uh, if we call something a segregation, we immediately give it a negative notion. And, uh, of course, if, if there is a segregation based on the, the principle of race, then, then sure, we should call this a negative phenomenon. But if we are discussing whether children with disabilities should be in regular schools with children who are non-disabled, then we are not talking about segregation 
in the first place, we may be talking about different type of schools. So we should be objective in this debate, and there are arguments for one way or the other. There are arguments of pedagogical, psychological, or political background, and it's up to us uh, to go for one or the other solution. And each country has to decide whether they should go for some streaming or whether they would go for one type of school for everybody. So to me, the question is still open. And um, even if I feel that something has been decided already and it was done, uh, uh, I always try to go back to this issue and uh, let's try and see what's best for children because there will always be arguments on one side or the other. I'd like to follow up on what has been said. I'd like to ask about the American experience, Professor Orkfield, because the debate has moved from the level of education and the, the debate of the experts to the emancipation and to this uh, different level. So is a common uh, education or education in mixed groups, has it any value added uh, towards the so-called diversified education? And this is an excellent issue, and I, I think the reason the previous speaker said segregation shouldn't be used is because it is an uncomfortable word, and it does happen to be related to opportunity in a very, very significant way in almost all of the research that we have done in the United States. Um, and it does happen to be related to outcomes in a very significant way. And people always want to call it something else. They want to call it anything but segregation because that's an uncomfortable and threatening word. And it should be threatening because it is, does produce unequal lives in important respects. Um, in the U.S. we have a huge amount of research on all of these issues. And we've been researching them for more than 50 years since the desegregation process began. I think that it's not just a matter of debate about what, whether segregation or separateness works better. Um, it is a matter of debate about how you can do this and how, under what conditions it works better or worse and the degree to which it solves problems. But I'd say that essentially we've reached the point in American research to say that segregation is almost always inferior in terms of educational opportunity. Not only segregation by race and ethnicity, but segregation by poverty, segregation in special education. We have a law now that requires the absolute minimum of, of separation of children in special education, for example, because the separate traditions that we had did not work. We invested many billions of dollars in them, and they were less effective than trying to put as a maximum feasible contact between special education students and, and others. Um, one of my daughters went to a preschool with children with mild disabilities, and she was there because they brought them together with kids who were extremely verbal. And most of these children, by the time they got to kindergarten, were in regular classes because basically they were not treated separately. They were treated as if they had the capacity and they developed the capacity. In terms of segregation effects, um, it's, there's not really a debate. I don't think anybody will say that segregated schools have ever been equal at any level, any significant level in the United States. We had a policy called separate but equal for 60 years from our Supreme Court. Nobody ever documented any community where the segregated schools were equal, in spite of the fact that they were often funded uh, substantially. Um, so in my view of this, we should be uncomfortable about segregation. We should use the term. It is related significantly to opportunity. Um, and there is no real evidence that works. If we take Finland, Finland ranks at the very top of the achievement levels in OECD comparison. If we take Germany, where they do segregate students um, for secondary education, it ranks among the most unequal nations, in spite of the fact that it spends a great deal of money on education. And it also has a much lower average attainment for the whole population than one would expect, given a country with its resources and educational institutions. I think there's a lot 
We actually looked uh, at all, every OECD country, and one piece of research that we did, we found that in every country, the educational achievement of students in the PISA test was related to their family poverty and was related to the poverty of the school. Uh, both of those things mattered and they mattered independently. So there was of all the different kinds of educational systems uh, involved in OECD, uh, there were none, there were no examples where the poverty, the intensity of poverty in the school did not matter for the educational achievement of the students, for example. So I think there's very powerful evidence that really needs to be confronted. It's not a matter of, of, uh, of simple debate. It's a matter of overwhelming evidence. I'd like to react on both uh, uh, Vlado Burian and Professor. What Vlado has said is theoretically right, but in practical level, on practical level, we need to realize that the output is so uh, important, be it in the question of um, the pedagogical issues or uh, the very question whether to educate dif uh, differentially or um, not, whether the differentiated uh, streams are um, separated or they merge somewhere that, uh, okay, it's part of their educational career, the children go separately, but then they get together, those two streams are mingled, and then they can, they have the equal rights. And this is what's not happening in Slovakia. There are two very separate streams. And that's what really um, uh, very um, worrying and disturbing for most of the teachers, even though they didn't want to get involved into the civil rights or human rights agenda. And even if this uh, issue stays at the level of human rights, this is not the case, actually, because we have very close educational systems or ways that are very limiting to many children, and not only Roma children. I would explain if a child is diagnosed with a certain mental problem if he's in borderline or uh, he's retarded, he's automatically sent into so-called special schools and those children can have a better care in special schools and they mostly, in most cases, they do have better care because they have specially trained teachers, they are psychologists, etc. and many get at the level of ordinary population. However, from this school, it is impossible for them to go to the secondary grammar school and to pass the secondary school living examination. So this is extremely limiting. And for many parents, and I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the Roma children only, and that's why the many parents of the children from socially disadvantaged families or children with um, Down syndrome or or with minor mental disabilities, or they are mentally challenged, and they, but they do manage, they do manage, uh, and still they are put into special schools, and that's where their potential for the development is really limited. The children diagnosed with the, the educational disorders, a learning disorders. I was in uh, one institution today uh, who uh, has many types of uh, this, such as dyslexia, etc., dysgraphy, etc. But he's very, very uh, lively. He is creative. Mm, he uh, makes great pictures. But there is not a single school that would like uh, that would uh, wish to accept him and they you know they just uh, he's talented but obviously the schools are not willing to accept him uh, the standard schools and they uh, there's a tendency to put him into special school and then the what what about his future prospects how uh, what how what kind of chances does he have if he wants to become a photographer well if he starts at a special school because then if you go to a special school you cannot develop in the way you could potentially and you would potentially and this is not only on theoretical level uh, uh, debates about segregation 
Um, those are things that limit the development of the healthy po uh, population as well, limiting uh, performance that will limit the children when they are interested in a secondary level education. And again, this is an issue of pedagogical character. Uh, how non-objective the assessment of children and students is in Slovakia, that we have this uh, marks this um, grades, grade system, and we made this uh, clear-cut borderline that those that do not have such a performance and do not get so, such and such grades won't be accepted to the secondary school education, and automatically those children are ruled out from the mainstream education, and they, need, they end up in the dead end. I'd like to ask... Uh, Another question, would it be enough to increase the permeability of the system and open it more uh, while it can offer various educational ways? Uh, could, could this be applicable for both Slovak and American style? Well, uh, uh, sorry, American education? Yes, we would go further. If the reform of educational system is about opening up the educational system and that it is open for anybody and everybody and everybody needs to apply for this education according to his capacities and limits and such as, such as it is in Sweden, uh, sorry, Switzerland, the debate would be of different character. We would be more talking about the physical separation, not about limited lives. And one more comment. Uh, yes, there are special schools in Finland, so that we uh, do not uh, mix up things. Most of the population is in general elementary schools, but really uh, mentally or the health uh, or physically challenged children are in special schools in order to raise them up to the general level and so that they could go on uh, anywhere and any how they would feel like. Susanna has mentioned Finland again, so I'd like to go back to that because Finland is a good uh, way of illustrating things. Uh, you've, uh, introduced uh, Finland as an example of the country where they prefer to have all the children in one type of school and not to differentiate. But we need to say that the system is set in such a way that each school is internally free to create conditions uh, for different types of children. So they have assistance uh, for children, very liberal curricula. So on the end side, you can see one building uh, saying regular school. But practically, what happens uh, is that inside, the school might be very different from the school in the next corner. Uh, we used to have a differentiation uh, between uh, the primary schools and then um, secondary schools with eight grades. Uh, and so uh, there would be different types of schools with very strict rules. So formally, we would have two types of buildings, but in reality and practically, all the secondary schools uh, with eight grades would be internally the same. So basically, the differentiation is lower in reality than it is in Finland, and that is why it is difficult to transfer experience from one country to another. It's hard to say, look at Finland. The integration works there. They have all types of children in one school. Good, but that's not an argument for Slovakia because uh, this is just a picture that we get from outside. We cannot ignore the fact that internally there is such a degree of, of differentiation that the conditions for each child are not the same there. And here I'd like to emphasize that uh, we have to be careful, as Mr. Orfield said, statistic analysis show that uh, statistical analysis of the uh, Finnish system can show something, but it doesn't mean that if we're going to try to copy that model in Slovakia, it doesn't mean we will get the same results. Uh, 
In our magazine called Dobra Škola, we've had a picture, and uh, I think the picture captures the whole issue. There is a huge wall, and there is a football match taking place behind the wall, and then there are two, three boys coming to the wall, and they want to see what's happening behind the wall, and they are of different height. Each of these boys has one box that they stand on in order to see through the wall. So for one of those children, it is okay to see because they are tall. This one is tall enough, but um, the middle one has to have two boxes in order to see, and uh, the sm smallest of these guys has to have three boxes in order to see the football match. So I'm asking, we want equality, but we want equality of what? Of what? Do we want to have equal boxes for all children? Do we want to have uh, equal curricula for everybody? Well, it might end up in such a way that those who are the smartest ones will make it somewhere, but those uh, who are on medium level or lower level, they will not make it anywhere. In the second picture, where you could see different uh, amount of boxes, which means tailoring the education to the needs of children, that means everybody has the same chances or opportunities. So in the picture you can see that if we want to achieve the same result with all the kids, it doesn't mean that the way has to be the same. The way has to be different. Here we are coming to the human rights viewpoint, and maybe not many of you know that uh, uh, we have translated the whole concept of equality into uh, the Slovak law where we talk about equality, because uh, the philosophy says that uh, equality doesn't mean sameness, it doesn't mean that it, everything has to be the same because equality uh, means everybody is entitled to, to having the same opportunities and uh, everybody has a, the same right to achieve the same results. But uh, it, we have difficulties working with this concept of equality. Uh, we still have this normalization concept of uh, perceiving everybody in the same way, but we are not the same. I'm not a, a teacher, so maybe I don't understand uh, everything, but uh, if we're not going to talk about segregation, then uh, we can talk about differentiation as a model, which can work well with different needs of different children so that uh, everybody's potential is, is reached. But if we only talk about differentiation and if we do not uh, uh, accept uh, that uh, decisions may be burdened by prejudices, racial stereotypes, uh, some technical equality instead of uh, practical equality, the system may become a tool of uh, enforcing and strengthening uh, discrimination patterns in society. And I think this is, that is the risk of differentiation that on the paper this may be an instrument because it will say that uh, children are uh, rightly ranked into different types of classes uh, and there is also um, individual failure of headmasters, of teachers, uh, of educational counselors uh, who make decisions on behalf of children and uh, to me if it was just a differentiation which ranks children to the right track, then uh, why uh, do we have uh, cases uh, where uh, Roma schools uh, would have the worst technical equipment? Uh, why, for instance, uh, teachers often don't want to teach in 
Roma schools and uh, usually uh, the qualification of teachers in Roma schools is lower than uh, in regular schools. Uh, so there is this racial stereotype and prejudices involved here. And even uh, if uh, we had uh, fair teachers and headmasters, so we can't forget the fact that segregation exists outside the school. Children often uh, live in segregated environment, uh, which lowers their chances uh, already at the beginning. So they are carrying their handicaps uh, with them because they come from segregated um, environment. Uh, and uh, there is also territorial segregation involved here and uh, I'm asking who is responsible for that uh, if we're talking about Roma population because with other nations uh, this problem might not be uh, so visible. So along with differentiation we have to talk about segregation. There is the second type of a burden on children and uh, I really believe uh, that Roma um, ghettos are as a, a result of our historical development and we have more obligation to help to children who are being born in these segregated communities today. And as Mr. Orfield said, uh, well, these schools have to be heavily subsidized in order to make up for this difference, uh, let alone uh, the racial stereotypes that uh, we still foster in the society, because uh, it shows uh, that the whole population uh, has now problems with accepting uh, otherness uh, and mainly uh, Roma ethnicity. So. These, all these factors have great influence, and we have to take that into consideration. Is there anything um, that you'd like to add? Um, I'd like to agree with some of the points that have been raised and to disagree with others. There are no perfect schools. I can't take you to any place where everything works perfectly. Um, there are better schools than worse schools. There is individual variation within every group and within every school, and teachers need to understand and adapt to that. Those are truths. Um, there is no magic answer that will deal with all inequality. On the other hand, there are some strong tendencies that are very important to think about. And I'd like to first deal with one of the negative possibilities that has been raised. And it is really very important to lots of families. <coughs> and then to talk about some positives of the integration experiences. <coughs> People are afraid that if school students who are less well prepared are brought into a middle class school, that the middle class children will suffer. This happens to be one of the things that we have actually studied more intensively than anything. We studied it for 50 years in hundreds of communities and many, many studies. There has just been no evidence that middle class children are, are harmed by being in an integrated school, so long as there's a really critical presence of middle class in the school. Um, basically, integrated schools tend to raise the performance of disadvantaged children and not to harm the performance of middle class children. This is a finding that even the conservatives in our country that are opposed to school integration basically accept as a fact. Um, it's, some, it's a deep fear of parents and there's very little support for it uh, in the empirical work that's been done for a very long time. And it's important for people to understand that. It's not a win, it's not a zero-sum game where somebody wins and somebody loses. If you integrate in a reasonable way, it's a positive-sum game where both sides gain. The, the majority of students gain the possibility of understanding and interacting across traditional lines and getting rid of their prejudices. And the minority students gain the possibility of better lives. Secondly, differentiation almost never works in a way that's fair. I mean, it makes sense to think about it, but in actual operation, the people that are most privileged always end up in the highest class and the highest uh, track 
uh, not in not placed in special education um, if their if their parents don't want them to be there, uh, and with the best teachers, and the students who are the least powerful end up in the bottom track in the separate school, and the the reality of the differentiation is usually there is no second chance. You never can get back on the normal track or the advanced track of schooling. Once you get placed in lower track classes or in a separate school, it's a life sentence. Um, if you get placed in a special education school, especially the behavioral categories of special education, it means you're both well, This is our experience, and I'm, I haven't done this work in Slovakia, so you're, you're, your world may be completely different, but our experience is if you get placed in that separate track of a uh, uh, behaviorally defined special education, you never return, and you don't graduate, and your life, you don't get a decent job as an adult, um, and you're, you're much more likely to end up in the criminal justice system because you don't have a role, a successful role in this society. Um, so think about it that way. It's one thing to talk about the theory, and it would be nice if every school fairly provided individualized, appropriate, differentiated instruction for everybody. In fact, it doesn't work that way in reality, at least in our society. In fact, it ends up as being uh, a self-perpetuating differentiation in which one group comes to the university and one group ends up with nothing. Uh, and there's almost no chance for a second chance to come back into the more successful parts. So if we're going to differentiate, those, are, those issues have to be paid very, very strict attention to. Because the normal way schools operate um, just perpetuate the inequalities and they do reflect the social class and ethnic inequalities that students start with and they do perpetuate them into the next generation. I'm following whether there are any questions. Okay, I see two hands. I'd like to move the debate further on and I'd like to ask on the systemic level and also at the level of the support of individual schools, be it in the American context or Slovak context. If you want the system or the specific schools to achieve their goals or to really um, follow or to, to try to follow the road of desegregation, what kind of ingredients of support there should be, what kind of support they should get from the local community, from the state? What has uh, been a good practice uh, abroad or in the U.S.? It's not easy for people to go through these changes. Most of our teachers have the same prejudices that the rest of the society have and, this, and limited experience in crossing these lines. And they usually don't get special support. They need to understand techniques that work in diverse classes um, they need to understand, there are some very good research-based techniques about how you handle diverse classes that produce positive outcomes. They need, the school needs to incorporate the students of the different groups, um, both academically and socially, um, by bringing them into collaborative academic projects and, and, and school activities, so that some students don't feel um, excluded. The teacher needs to know that she shouldn't have the Roma kids sitting at the back of the corner of the room. She should assign them to seats uh, so that those children aren't isolated. Uh, that should be a decision the teacher makes. Not, just, not to let the school just replicate the external world, but to, to help. What we're trying to do in a diverse school is, is create a world that's more fair than the external world and a world that leads to real opportunity for children on the individual level rather than on the, on the group that they happen to be born into level. Um, so we need to help teachers have some techniques. We need to bring the parents of all the groups positively into the school and also to have them working together. Um, and we need to um, expect the leaders of our schools to enunciate a value of fair treatment. Uh, and to let everybody know uh, that whatever their prejudices might be, um, they're going to treat all children fairly and the discipline is going to be provided fairly 
uh, and they're going to be expected to communicate with all the parents. Um, those are things that are helpful. Now, in the U.S., in the last 30 years, a lot of our diversity has been handled by creating schools that are, are academically advanced, that all parents want to go to, but are, that are planned to be diverse, called magnet schools. So that creates a positive academic incentive for, for parents to choose to be in diverse schools. In other words, sometimes we think of diverse schools as, the, as, as threatening, but uh, you can create a diverse school that actually is accelerated and actually gives the child, all children, a better chance. Um, so if we think of it, we can take a school building that might not have been a successful school and say, we're going to make this a school where all the children learn how to operate um, in computers in an effective way. We can have the school where they're going to learn how to write and publish newspapers electronically. Um, those are things that aren't very complicated to do if you get people who understand these systems. And you make it a preference. You say, only we can only admit a certain number of students to this school, and this school is going to be part Roma and part um, other students. Um, and if you really want to come, and if you really want to teach there, you can come. We, we found that we have millions of students in schools like this in the U.S. now. We found that teachers want to come to schools like that, parents want to come to schools like that, and they often are diverse. In other words, you can get diversity in various ways, and you can think of diversity as being part of accelerating academic opportunities as well as just being sharing existing academic opportunities. So it's important to think that it would be worth to invest some money in a school to give to make it from a school that was seen as a school people wouldn't want to go to, to a school that people fight to get into. Um, and it can be done with imagination and with the creation of special academic opportunities. And universities can play an important role in doing that. Nedáme nezapojiť sa. Vy na Slovensku totiž to... To, čo povedal pán profesor, veľmi dobre znelo a teraz to ale veľmi, veľmi brutálne dám do súterénu. Bohužiaľ. Pretože na Slovensku máme podporovanú tzv. integráciu. Táto integrácia je podporovaná v školskom zákone, táto integrácia je oficiálne podporovaná v tzv. každoročne vydávaných pedagogicko-organizačných pokynoch. V týchto pokynoch, ktoré ministerstvo školstva vydáva, ktoré sú pre školy záväzné, sú každoročne jasne deklarované postupy, ktoré majú školy motivovať k tomu, aby integrovali deti zo sociálne znevýhodneného posledia, ale teda najmä deti so, zdravotne, so zdravotným znevýhodnením a podobne. Ako vyzerá ale tá skutočnosť? Tá skutočnosť vyzerá tak, že v prvom rade máme školy, ktoré absolútne nevyhovujú akýkoľvek integrácii telesne postihnutých detí. Nemáme debarierizované školy a akákoľvek ďalšia snaha tej školy o nejakú debarierizáciu, o nejakú rampu alebo podobne, naráža na finančné problémy samozrejme a mnohé školy potom aj stiahnu v rámci eurofondov po úplne iných projektoch, ako by mohli teda e, túto školu dovyvolovať takýmito vecami, ktoré by pomohli ich žiakom. Naozaj som sa stretla so školou v malom mestečku pri Bratislave, kde mali vozičkárku, neboli schopní urobiť tejto vozičkárke rampu, ale pritom e, použili projekt z eurofondu na vytvorenie bylinkovej záhrady. Takže e, áno, je to len vo forme odporúčaní školám, ale nie je tu žiadna povinnosť škôl zabezpečiť podmienky pre takéto deti v prípade, že rodič vyjadrí záujem, aby toto dieťa bolo vzdelávané v bežnej škole. Druhá oblasť problémov sú učiteľia. Tí nie sú absolútne pripravení na prácu s takýmito deťmi. Oni sú predmetári. A to sa nezmenilo. To znamená, že oni len vo svojom voľnom čase a z vlastnej iniciatívy môžu navštevovať rôzne školenia v tzv. ďalšom vzdelávaní, respektíve kontinuálnom vzdelávaní učiteľov, ktoré ich doškolujú v práci s týmito deťmi. 
naši študenti stále nie sú na vysokých školách vzdelávaní v tejto práci. A ani súčasný návrh, nejaká správa o stave školstva teraz leží vo vláde a na, v Národnej rade, ale ani tu nie sú jasné uh, impulzy k zmene prípravy, pregraduálnej prípravy učiteľov. My sme navrhovali napríklad takú vec, aby sa študenti, ktorí by mali mať rozhodne oveľa viacej praxe učiteľe, lebo u nás je to veľmi minimálne, tam je to preklopené, maximálne jedna tretina času ide do škôl, z jednej tretiny, dve tretiny sedia v škole, tak sa usilujeme neustále o to, aby boli viacej prakticky vzdelávaní, aby sa zo študentov urobili napríklad asistenti, aby mali túto časť praxe povinne absolvovať ako asistenti takýchto detí v bežných školách. Jednak by to bola úspora finančná, jednak by to bola pre nich skúsenosť. Na tretej strane by to aj tie školy motivovalo k tomu, že budú mať nejakú pomoc, to znamená, že tieto deti sa nemusia báť e, integrovať do, do bežných škôl. Zatiaľ sa tam nestretlo so žiadnym e, pochopením. Takže to je druhá kapitola, nevzdelaní a nepripravení učiteľia. Tretia kapitola sú pomôcky. Školy absolútne nemajú takéto pomôcky, ktoré by pomohli týmto deťom lepšie sa vzdelávať. Naopak majú jednotné kurikulum, tak ako sme si hovorili. Máme síce pocit, že tu prebieha nejaká reforma vzdelávania, ale bohužiaľ tie štandardy, ktoré sú pre jednotlivé vzdelávacie stupne, nie sú odstupňované ani v úrovni dosiahnutia, to znamená, oni sú platné pre všetkých rovnako. Musia ich zvládnuť všetci rovnako. Nemajú oni level 1, 2, 3, to znamená minimálne požiadavky, stredné alebo teda priemerné a potom maximálne. Individuálne sa môžu dosiahnuť až tieto. To sa, to sa jednoducho u nás nepodarilo diferencovať. Čiže tie deti sú odsudené na to, že musia zvládať všetko to učivo tak a v takom tempe a takou rýchlosťou, ako bežné deti, ktoré problémy nemajú. Je tu taká možná pompočka, a to je vytvorenie tzv. individuálneho študijného plánu. Škola môže integrovať dieťa, ktoré má aj nejaké znevýhodnenie a môže mu vytvoriť individuálny študijný plán, ktorý dokonca môže obohatiť o špecializované predmety, ako je napríklad dôvodpedia, pohybová výchova, priestorová výchova a podobne, kde si to tieto deti priamo vyžadujú a to je práve to vyrovnávanie ich handicapu. Bohužiaľ, prax je taká, že na týchto školách Buď nie sú vôbec tieto individuálne plány urobené, alebo ak sú, a sú tam aj formálne zriadené tieto špeciálne predmety, nikto ich neučí, pretože učiteľia ich učiť nevedia. Ak aj škola má špeciálneho pedagóga, tak ten napríklad nemôže vyučovať ten predmet logopédia, nemôže s ním robiť logopedické cvičenia, lebo nemá odbornosť. A za to vďačíme práve zákonu o e, pedagogických zamestnancoch a odborných zamestnancoch, ktorí tak úzko špecifikovali ich kvalifikačné predpoklady, čo môžu a čo nemôžu na školách robiť, že sme de facto obmedzili flexibilitu a pružnosť práce s deťmi. To znamená, že nikto to na tej škole tomu dieťaťu nedáva. Pýtame sa, že či by to nemohli urobiť tie poradenské centrá alebo centrá špeciálno-pedagogického poradenstva alebo psychologického poradenstva. Áno, mohli by to urobiť, ale to znamená, že to dieťa by muselo chodiť každý týždeň na niekoľko hodín na druhé miesto a tam s ním by urobili logopedické cvičenie. Potom by prišlo na tretie miesto a tam s ním by urobili pohybové cvičenie. Takže... Um, Áno, na jednej strane máme v zákone integráciu, ale tento štát nerobí prakticky vôbec nič na to, aby tú školu podporil v tom, aby mohla integrovať tie deti a aby tie deti z toho mali úžitok. A čo je úplne najhoršie, tak to je tá obmedzená možnosť voľby. Pre rodiča, ktorý sa rozhodne, že chce dať to dieťa aj s týmito ľahkými nejakými handicapmi do bežnej školy, aj keď nie kvôli tej akademickej dráhe, aj keď nie kvôli tomu, aby mohlo ísť na gymnáziu, Chcel dať do tej bežnej školy práve preto, aby vyrastalo vo svojom prostredí. Pretože je komunikatívne, má kamarátov v dome, má kamarátov na sedlisku, chodí do nejakých krúžkov, chce prosto pre neho normálnu školu. V našom zákone je to urobené tak, že ak škola, na škole je bremeno rozhodovania, či to dieťa príjme alebo nepríjme. Ak škola nemá vytvorené podmienky, môže to dieťa odmietnúť a povie, že nemá pre neho vytvorené podmienky. V takomto prípade musí rodič hľadať druhú, tretiu, štvrtú, piatú školu. Ak sa napriek tomu rozhodne, že ho stále odmieta, že na tom trvá, tak vo svojej podstate v rámci zákona o rodine ešte ono prestupuje akúsi zákonnú mieru, pretože nedbá na blaho svojho dieťaťa, pretože škola tvrdí, že mu nevie zabezpečiť podmienky. 
ak rodič trvá na tom, že chce v bežnej škole napriek tomuto dieťa, tak vlastne on je postihnutelný zákonom, pretože nedbá na blaho svojho dieťaťa a nerešpektuje to, že škola pre ňa tie podmienky vytvorené nemá. Takáto je situácia u nás. To je realita a to sa stáva bežným ľuďom, to sa nestáva, povedzme, segregovaným ľuďom, ktorí žijú v osadách, ktorí nemajú ani túto možnosť, ani tú, nevedia uplatniť tú svoju slobodnú vojnu. Ďakujem. Takže, toľko. Toto depresívne diagnosti. Takže, pokračovanie nebude krajšie. Ja asi veľmi skoršie krátko nadviažem, že ak Zuzana Stuto pomenovala niečo, čo sme snažili na tým poznačiť, ako všeobecný súterevný marazmus školského systému, tak to asi ešte pôsobí, že ste romské dieťa zosobí. A teraz nie je to ako keby rozhľadá do podrobnosti, ale keď toto je ako stav ešte neutrálny, ako by som povedal, nezaťažený nejakým trevers, ako skupinou, ktorá je najviac ako keby nepríjímaná v tejto spoločnosti. A už si viem predstaviť to tak, že nie neromské dieťa alebo bežné dieťa nie z elitnej rodiny, že jeho cesta tiež už nie je ľahká, častokrát s jedným dvoma handicapmi, už to má stiažené a teraz ešte navyše osada. A nad tým už ani nikto nerozmyšľa. Ale my keď sme dobre sedli s pánom profesorom, jedna z tých otázov bola, že čo vlastne priviedlo v Amerike tú zmenu a ja si netrúfam to vôbec nejako reprodukovať, lebo je tam veľa tých faktorov a práve čo mňa odrádza, alebo čo mňa vedie k tej skepsie je, že to nebol nejaký jednoduchý lineárny proces, jedna vec sa udiala a systém sa zmenil, ale je to niečo, čo... It was something that people call a social revolution because there were several parallel factors which occurred, but when Mr. Orford said that federal government decided not to finance schools who are segregated and the schools sued it, it's something I cannot imagine because uh, uh, we are missing a political will or a voice for the inclusion in society. No one has openly said that we don't want segregation in society. If this existed, we would find systemic support. Uh, but uh, yeah. It must be obvious to everybody that this is not uh, something that people benefit from in this country. But uh, still, it looks like uh, uh, we are mad, we are crazy when we risk all this long-term sustenance of uh, such system. It starts uh, uh, with um, kindergartens. Uh, the common sense uh, tells you that if uh, Roma children are not in kindergartens, of course their pr perspectives are worse. Uh, uh, a World Bank often uh, um, demonstrates the graph of the development of a child. It tells us clearly that if we do not do something until the age of six, uh, there is not much hope for doing anything uh, in terms of compensating the handicaps later on. So this is a luxury that we are now having uh, by risking the future of all these children. So for a decade we've had this topic of uh, kindergarten education and we haven't done anything, uh, we haven't gone anywhere. So there is complete absence of a decision about uh, this system that we have at the moment because it uh, is harming everybody. And I believe this country has no value orientation defined, and uh, we've never said that we want a country where everybody has a chance for success. Uh, so we've talked about uh, the value orientation and um, marism in the society. So we need to think about all these aspects, and Mr. Burian. Um, my topic is about the system harming everybody. Those of you who know me uh, know well uh, that uh, I'm very critical of the current educational system in this country. Uh, and I'd like to say that uh, uh, we have schools uh, which work well for a so-called normal population and there are some minority groups uh, uh, and we're dealing with the problems whether they should be in or out. Uh, 
No, the system is bad for everybody. I don't like a notion of a, um, children with special learning needs because um, it uh, seems like uh, other children have the same needs and there are some, some few children with special needs. No, everybody has special learning needs. Everybody is different and uh, the school system ignores this. Uh, the system is uh, designed uh, for an imaginary standardized child who does not exist in reality. And majority of uh, children from majority population can adapt somehow to existing system. And if we have a child with a special need or a child from disadvantaged environment, then the deviation from the natural needs is so vast that the child cannot adapt anymore to the uniform system. So to me, the way out would be an individual study plan. For me, an ideal school would be a school where everybody would have their own individual studying style or plan. Uh, so uh, we should reassess uh, the concept of having 30 children in a classroom with the same curricula, with the same plan, same pace of learning to a school with individualized plans and such school could cater for the needs of Roma, for Hungarian minorities, for persons with disabilities, because everybody would have their own pace of learning, their own curricula. Uh, division of a time in the class would not be 45 minute lesson, but it would last for as long as a child can focus because the span of attention of, of children differs. So with this differentiation, everybody would be different and, and nobody, nobody would speak out. Uh, and when we compare ourselves with uh, Holland, with uh, Great Britain, etc., uh, this uniform uh, production of children um, is very unique and uh, I'm not against integration because of some philosophical reasons, but to me it seems that the system is bad enough even for those majority children, uh, let alone the children who have even more special needs than the majority population. It wouldn't be good for them to integrate them into this bad system at the moment. So if the school system was liberalized, if uh, schools had free hands uh, to fill the mornings uh, in a more fruitful and diverse manner regarding their special needs, it might be beneficial for, for all kids. The uh, United States um, are known for the optimism. So um, I'm thinking about Mr. Orfield. Uh, how are you coping with the dose of uh, negativism that you've just received? And now I'd like to open space for questions. Um, uh, there's a question for Mr. Orfield. And this was a question concerning a research uh, that you mentioned. You've said that in case that a school is not segregated, uh, it means um, it case there is for the needs of uh, all the different social classes, etc. You've said that this is positive on the results of children with the lower social classes. Uh, the question is now, what is the critical mass of students from the middle class in order to achieve this effect in the school? Uh, th in other words, um, does this effect differ with the size of school, with uh, the, the placement of the school in a region, etc.? The truth is that there isn't a, a magic number. You know, it's 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 much more of a continuum than it is a a particular critical point. 
I think that there, for there to be beneficial effects, there has to be a significant presence of middle class children in the school. I think some people say the ideal ratio is 50-50. Um, other people say it's a representation, a reasonable representation of a larger community population. Um, but uh, we have seen positive results in schools with a very uh, different levels of middle class population. Where we, the only place we see negative results is where the middle class child is put in overwhelmingly impoverished school. But I'd like to say something about the previous question about optimism, uh, which is uh, Americans are optimistic. You know, they believe that they can reform things, um, and they constantly create new things. Um, what I would say is I've been through many very pessimistic discussions about this issue in many communities that actually then moved on to do something constructive and actually solve things. Part of the process of, is a kind of agonizing review of all the obstacles that you have to face. Then what has to happen is somebody has to, what we call in America, pull up their socks and do something and, and create some examples. Uh, and watch them and per perfect them because you know, all of these things take a while to work effectively. Um, but if you just sit around and feel sorry for yourself, uh, nothing ever gets done. Uh, there are a lot of creative possibilities and I have seen remarkable schools that are both diverse and very much improved in desperately poor communities in the United States that have been created by leadership, by educational leadership, by they're making new possibilities. Um, and you know, you have to apply imagination and you have to work hard on these things and you have to change yourself and understand things that you don't fully understand. But the other part of this is I've actually seen people changed. I've seen people accomplish things that they didn't think were possible. I've seen people learn about the humanity and the capacity and the dreams of people who were previously excluded. I've seen people like that become leaders and go to the greatest universities in my country and become important leaders um, who would have been, whose talent just would have been written off completely historically and the way before we started to do these things. We have got very hard challenges in our country still. We're not anywhere near finished. But to say that nothing can be done um, is, is you know, it's, it's like a bad French movie. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, have to watch one of our things that has a happy ending. You, know? you don't believe that the world is endlessly pessimistic and nothing can be done. And, and nobody has ever accomplished anything important without daring and imagination. Zajímavé ako v rôznych krajinách máme iné etnony, etnonymické pomenovanie a to je niečo zlé. It's really interesting how we in different countries we name bad things. You say from bad French movie, we say in Slovak we say other things, so that's really interesting. Uh, I have changed my question five times already because you have already responded to my previous questions, but I would like to respond to this dialogue of optimism and pessimism. My uh, experience is, uh, because I participated in the Teachers Forum and the social networks and various conferences, when we start talking about inclusive uh, education, it's like uh, it's like red color for a bull. Like inclusive education uh, really provokes a huge resistance among teachers. Uh, you know, we have been talking about how we should uh, pay attention to the education of teachers and training of the teachers, that there are certain techniques for how to react on the individual needs of the students. But in spite of the fact that there are those examples, what is the problem? Why the teachers are so resistant? Why they refuse the inclusive education as such? 
And I'd like to move it to the level of uh, specific uh, examples that Professor Orfield was saying that you need to pull up your socks and just do something. You were discussing the systemic changes, but and my question is, could we introduce inclusive uh, elements in the existing system in Slovakia? And how those small changes in school in their schools could look like because the presumption that the value orientation that we have been talking about is going to come about in within four years is a quite non-realistic expectation and in spite of that I would really not like to sit around and be unhappy and feel sorry about myself and be pessimistic and I don't want to give up this idea of um, uh, equal opportunities so the co two questions how to work with the resistance of the teachers to the issue of inclusive education and the second is specific examples of good practice how one could introduce inclusive instruments or inclusive things into the existing system this is a question probably to everybody and i would really like to ask susanna about the introduction of inclusive elements into the existing uh, existing uh, system and uh, when it comes to resistance i would like to welcome anybody's answer okay i'd like to say one thing about resistance this has to do with the low level of preparedness and with what vladoburin and lato is uh, saying that the people of this country are not ready for it. As all people of this country, uh, there is no political will and there is no declared vision or target towards the improvement. And just one example, that on one hand, uh, there are people who would like to uh, be educated in the standard schools and that some people are trying to provide for education uh, at the normal schools and on the other side, on the other hand, there is majority and the uh, society there. Those two groups uh, are really very much against of inclusion. And we talk about the Roma children, they uh, are lucky in speech marks or that there is a blessing in disguise for them that there are various activists and uh, civil rights organizations that carry their issue and they talk about their issue if we talk about children with uh, who that are physically a uh, challenge or handicapped and there are subgroups of the parents that are totally against inclusion who fight with other parents uh, who would like to have uh, their kids included and uh, there's this, this crazy example that in the school for uh, deaf children or children with uh, hearing impairments. So there is an animosity against children with multiple disorders, uh, and uh, you know the peep, uh, the parents of the children that have hearing impairment are saying, "Oh, put those children somewhere else because we don't want our kids to be in contact with them." And now we want from an ordinary teacher to welcome uh, warmly somebody. No, with multiple um, disabilities or problems or challenges. This is just an illusion. And what kind of changes could be introduced in the existing system? We were proposing this, um, the prep class for at the, at the elementary level. There are, there's uh, this opportunity only for the Roma children currently. But if we opened it up for all the disadvantaged groups, uh, and the, this would be really open, and that there will be hard work, there will be special teachers, uh, like more teachers and special staff. If we don't have kindergartens, at least we could do this. And then the curricula needs to be narrowed down and needs to be differentiated uh, to the level uh, that uh, children with slower pace could really catch up and could learn everything because we, there is so much in the curricula. We just enforce the academic drill on the children and the teachers are led to, you know, to, towards this goal also by the ministry. Today, uh, the results of testing nine are published. What is the goal of the elementary school? 
Well, in our society, it's to get good results in testing number nine. And um, actually, it's even announced that the schools are going to get an uh, adequate amount of money depending on how they, uh, what was their performance in the test. So the, the, there's a complex of issues. Those are three specific steps that could be done immediately in the existing system. There is no clear answer about this. What is the deficit? What I am missing? First, I am convinced that every single reform that has been carried out successfully really required very strong personal involvement of a specific leader that convinced the society that this is needed. This is not a grassroots initiative. There is no critical mass that would understand uh, of any social movement that realizes certain need. But it was rather one. Po uh, 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 it was a political elite that convinced us. That, okay, we need to follow this direction. I believe that there must be somebody who will inspire us, who will enlighten this sparkle in us and uh, we will start believing that yes the schools need to look differently and you know within those 20 years there's this saying that uh, there are very few of us who would say that uh, the school system the educational system has been reformed uh, even though there have been so many reforms uh, most uh, of us would agree that not a major change has been made and why there have been always such high expectations from every single minister not there was not a single minister who would really uh, inspire and who would uh, uh, really give this uh, clear um, idea yes i know what we need to do yes we need to follow this direction and what I want to say is that uh, what is the second aspect that will be really difficult is even when we mentioned Finland, but there were uh, recently there were certain articles uh, uh, published, and you know they made the decision to change the system uh, 50 years ago, and the first changes occurred 30 years ago, and this is the case of uh, the U.S. I don't believe that, that there was a euphoria at the beginning of the process. Yes, black children in the uh, in the school system, and all of a sudden that how everybody uh, became happy about the good performance. We need to realize how long is the way that there is an increased amount of problems. Uh, and uh, any um, potential problems uh, generate more challenges and pressures. And I don't have a feeling that any single political police in Slovakia uh, has made this decision that even though the short term uh, impact may be partially negative, we want to go for it. And, you know, I may be this post socialistic type of person. Imagine what kind of, and, and let's see what kind of uh, mm, royalty is uh, the Ministry of Education, is, is, uh, uh, how difficult it is to penetrate with a new idea, vision uh, uh, to this sector. And it, 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 I would be so happy if we just uh, break down this ministry and build a completely new one. You have the great wonderful skill that you finish always in the point where I want to follow up. One of the things that was really uh, why the socialist uh, uh, regime was criticized was so-called social engineering, that uh, a sort of an ideological center will bring have the idea what is good for the people, and they will then tell the people that this is the way we should go, and they will act in that way. Despite this, even today, some people believe it and they want to apply this method in order to tackle the issues in society. I don't think the problems we're discussing here today can ever be resolved by the way that we put something in the law, we condemn some behavior as uh, 
something to be punished or penalized uh, by ordering parents uh, to put their children into the closest school possible, etc. I'm saying this, uh, and I'm trying to get to, to resistance of teachers and parents, because this is not only a problem of teachers, but also a problem of parents. There is one differentiation we did not talk about today, and that is spontaneous segregation or differentiation. It really exists in reality that there would be two schools in one community, and if there is a Roma school, uh, or a school with more Roma, then all of the majority population children would be put into the other school. And this way, Roma segregated school was created as a result of some individual decisions of parents. And that is a factor which uh, we will never prevent just by putting something into law and just by considering the human rights convention and we underestimate this fact we are trying to uh, be very directive and uh, to enforce things through a legal way but we don't listen to parents if you ask a parent why are you taking away your children from the school they will tell you six reasons why they don't want to have their children in a classroom with 20 Roma children and I'm sure uh, that uh, this is in no way racism uh, this is their own opinion and if a school managed to somehow deal with these six uh, arguments then the parents would not take away their children in many cases it's their rational consideration of a situation their individual decision because uh, they just want to put their children in a school where there are not so many Roma or they want to have their children in a private school. And if uh, we in a society don't like it, we should not put forth more prohibitions. We should remove the reasons for this behavior in society. And if uh, someone at the government's office uh, uh, tells uh, headmasters or teachers to do this and this. Uh, they, they can't just solve these situations because they, they are in a practical everyday situation. They have to deal with these situations regardless of the, the, the laws. So uh, many teachers uh, often say that uh, they are not against uh, the, these ideas, they just practically are not able uh, to, to implement uh, these steps in their everyday lives. They don't know how to translate these nice sentences into practice. Uh, there is a, a famous case of teachers from a small village in Eastern Slovakia called Dobšina, and uh, they really are successful in operating an integrated school uh, with uh, different um, uh, children with disabilities, minorities, etc. And they, they, they are managing uh, just because uh, a headmaster has created conditions for this. And uh, if we have more examples like this, uh, I think we will get rid of this resistance. Uh, uh, Sometimes a strong will is not enough, uh, even though Americans might not agree with me. Uh, Americans would uh, find the, well, the, the strong will as sufficient, but sometimes that's not enough. Is there any short question? I'd like to comment on what Mr. Burian said. I sit together with parents, listen to their reasons why they want to take away their children from the schools with Roma children. I think there is one limitation to what you've said. Uh, the reasons for parents uh, to take away their children usually are prejudices. Many times you wouldn't find uh, any 
a substantive argument in what they were saying. It's just a matter of prejudices. They just don't want to have their children together with Roma children in a class. And I think this is something you can only achieve by a, a regulation. And then I've liked uh, the boxes near the wall uh, while kids were watching football match. And uh, the second and the third box uh, could be an integration for Roma children in order to see behind the wall we could help them with integration. Well, maybe that would be the, s the, the, the second and the third box for them, the integration into schools. Uh, just a s small comment. Uh, of course, prejudices uh, exist. But as, as a human right activist, I have to admit uh, that the coexistence of Roma and non-Roma children and tensions uh, created are not only a result of some uh, rightist uh, extremist opinions, uh, the, the everyday coexistence uh, brings about problems. And the question is, uh, what are the reasons? As a pro-Roma activist, I believe uh, there are deep-rooted uh, reasons for it, uh, the, the level of hygiene, um, the level of their education. Um, so being a parent of non-Roma child in a strongly Roma a school is not an easy reality. We often receive emails from these parents, uh, and I understand it's difficult. Non-Roma living in this uh, very Roma, let's say, environment uh, is not an easy life. Um, and uh, uh, we often uh, fail to understand that we are just uh, living through the effects of our deeds a long time ago and we all need to be a little more generous to each other and we have to admit that uh, there are consequences to our actions and these actions may have happened a long time ago but uh, they still exist and we all have to bring uh, some victim and we have to try and find ways uh, of coexisting. So this is just one of my recommendations. I think in our educational system uh, we need uh, uh, to understand that the teachers uh, live uh, with the results uh, of these actions long time ago every day. So we have to understand uh, it's difficult for them uh, and we still be have to believe in every child and we've never built our educational system on the real trust in every child. Uh, very shortly, I'd like to, re to react to the topic of uh, prejudice. Uh, a prejudice um, uh, is an ideological word. Um, I've seen a discussion on TV recently, and there were some concrete comments of parents who were withdrawing their children from a um, very Roma school. Uh, the parents said that Roma keep bringing lies uh, into the classroom uh, and uh, hepatitis. The Roma come hungry to schools, and when they are hungry, they take away uh, the food from non-Roma children. There are often fights in the schools, uh, but that may happen in any school. Uh, Roma children are often vulgar. Uh, they are often using um, four-letter words. Uh, Roma usually are sexually more matured, usually. So you might have a 15-year-old uh, uh, girl in a class uh, who are pregnant already. And uh, so Roma were often discussing issues uh, which seem to non not relevant to non-Roma parents. And uh, Often in the classroom, Roma children were so badly behaved 
that uh, teachers could not really focus on teaching. And this is not a prejudice. Any, none of these arguments uh, is a prejudice. This is just a matter of fact that these things happen. Uh, if Roma children were sitting in a classroom, they were neat, they weren't hungry, um, it would be okay. Nobody would uh, object. Nobody would uh, say, I don't want to be with them because they are Roma. Nobody would uh, have anything against them. If these Roma children behaved in more or less the same way as non-Roma children, no one would object. And uh, if there were non-Roma children who would fight a lot, they would swear a lot, and they would be hungry, and they, they would be of the major majority population, the parents would object against them the same way. So this is not a Roma problem. These are concrete arguments that, that are justified. And if a school managed to deal with these problems, then I believe the exodus of, uh, let's say, white children would stop. I'd like to hand it over to Mr. Uh, Gary Orfield for the last word, and I very much hope for a bit of optimism how to break this vicious circle. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you uh, very much for the chance to be with you for this long discussion and to hear such vigorous discussion on important issues. I have heard virtually the same exact words in many settings in the United States about all of these issues that were raised. Um, it doesn't mean that our solutions would work for you, you have a different society, but um, I should, it made me think as I was hearing some of these arguments about the argument that the southern states made to the United States Supreme Court before they found, before they, before it found that segregation was as they said, inherently unequal. In, 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 unequal in fundamental nature and incurable within the system of segregation. The South hired the most important, the 17 states that were segregated, hired the most um, famous lawyer in the United States to go before the Supreme Court to argue all of the things that were said here today. By the, the children could not adapt, they would not be accepted, they were better off in the segregated schools, um, the, the teachers didn't know what to do. All of these arguments were made. And then they actually desegregated the schools. In many communities that were as disadvantaged as you're talking about, desperately poor rural farm workers with no money, were dirty, and had never lived in a middle class setting. We actually did this in many of the most destitute communities in, in our country. Um, and it proved that none of these things that were predicted happened on any large scale. Certainly there were some fights in schools. Certainly some kids used bad words. Certainly some girls got pregnant. But by and large, it was a peaceful process. And by and large, actually, there were major gains for the students who had been excluded. And we created a different country. The reason that we have an African-American president now who won whole states of the South is because children grew up together crossing these racial lines. Because we learned about the capacity and talent that people had that would have been completely written off in our society historically. Um, we are a long way from finished with this. It will be something that we'll have to keep working on for the whole history of our country because we're a deeply diverse country. But the arguments about the impossibility of doing anything and the implicit uh, result of that, which is just to leave these people excluded in their separate place that will never succeed um, and just write them off as part of your civilization um, is also just not an acceptable argument. Um, in, in terms of thinking about the future of what's going to happen in civilization. We have lived through this. We haven't come out perfectly. But these extreme stereotypes and fears that are voiced here uh, did not come true. Teachers didn't know what to do, but teachers learned. Um, teachers were taught. Teachers were given support. They were given techniques that worked better. Some of the teachers who just had 
deeply embedded racial prejudices that couldn't deal with it, decided to have a different kind of career, which was good for everybody since they were conveying their prejudices to the students and so forth. Uh, other people were attracted in. The teachers came out of the communities, the minority communities, that never produced very much in the way of teachers. Professionals emerged out of this process. Um, it was a very, very powerful process. So I'm not telling you that any of this stuff is easy, but I am telling you almost everything that you're worried about was things that we worried about too. And they did not work out the way that people feared that they would work out. And there were possibilities on the positive side that many people never could have imagined. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And if I may sing to Professor Gay Orfield and the other participants, Zuzana Zimanovala Tsaravec Vladimir Burian, and I'd like to mention one, uh, one uh, again, uh, when you were talking uh, about the uh, basement, that the Slovak educational uh, system is like a basement, is a real savage. Uh, from the savage, you can only go upwards, so we, we should go upwards, and I hope that we will go upwards. And thank you very much uh, for your participation, and I'm looking forward to the next face-to-face -face discussion. Goodbye.